Ones, I will give you the greatest games on earth. Show them you can fight or die trying. From the producers of 300, a four horse race is a suicide. Let the games begin! Starring Oscar winner Anthony Hopkins. Behold, this arena will be built for Rome. Rise or die. Those About to Die, a new Peacock original series streaming July 18th. It's April 25th, 1970, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that the soul hit Band of Gold by Frida Payne entered the Billboard Top 100, two months after its initial release, on a pretty meandering journey to smash hit status. It would have to wait two months to reach its US peak of the number three position, but another two months later it would hit the UK number one spot where it spent six glorious weeks. That's not as long and meandering a journey as Mariah Carey's path with All I Want for Christmas is You, but it's still, that's a long time. Well, it's a grower, not a shower, isn't it? I think it's one of those, like, because I've been listening to it a lot this week whilst we've been preparing for this episode. Once you start listening to it a lot, it's an earworm, isn't it? So if you don't remember, mm. it's the one that goes, Since you be all, all that's left is a bad go. <laughs> that one <laughs> that's the that's the yeah, yeah, karaoke version yeah, of it. yeah club one. singer but uh I, it's one that i've heard my whole life but like you know if you don't hear it regularly you could easily forget about it if you see what i mean it, i don't know it doesn't seem like a stop in the name of mm. love does it but it was written by the people who wrote stop in the name of love it was written by holland dogia holland one of the big writing teams for motown who between them had clocked up an astonishing 13 u.s number ones baby love sugar pie honey bunch bernadette but it was still an exciting release for them because it was the first on Invictus, their breakaway label. So they had to use an alias on the writing credits. They had to use a pseudonym because they were still under contract to Barry Gordy when it came out. So it wasn't a Motown record. And when they actually first offered the song to Frida Payne, she didn't want to record it because she thought that the lyrics were more appropriate to a teenager or at least a very young woman. And because she was <laughs> the grand old age of 30 years old, she thought that it wasn't going to be one that was right for her. But the song went on to be a classic largely because of the lyrics, which have been interpreted and reinterpreted various ways over the years. But it really took a great deal of persuasion from a chap called Ron Dunbar, who was credited as another writer before she reluctantly gave in and said, yeah, OK, I'll do it. Ron Dunbar has really leaned into his status as co-writer of Band of Gold. But if you listen to Lamont Dozier, who was one of the Holland Dozier Holland writing team, obviously he was Dozier, he has a pretty different story. So it's credited to Ron Dunbar and Edith Wayne. Now, Edith Wayne was the pseudonym. And according to Lamont Dozier, Ron Dunbar was a talent scout working on the label. He was credited just for convenience sake. But if you listen to Ron Dunbar, he has lots of thoughts on the meaning of the lyrics that he claims to have co-written. So it's kind of hard to know exactly what's happened there. Also, Dozier was quite familiar with pushback from the artists that he worked with. And he said that he really wasn't surprised that Payne wasn't keen on Band of Gold because the Supremes had pushed back on Where Did Our Love Go? And that went on to become their first number one. And the Four Tops (laughs) didn't always like what they sang and he said even the funk brothers would sometimes go what is this man even the funk brothers <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the funk brothers were sort of the motown house band and this track also has some fantastic backing artists on it the lead guitarist on yeah. band of gold is ray parker jr of ghostbusters fame at the age of 15 as well and the backing singers were joyce vincent wilson and telma hopkins who you probably wouldn't know their names but they would go on to be the dawn of tony orlando and dawn fame i.e the band behind knock three times and candida okay so lots of musical heritage going on but it is the lyrics isn't it that I think have made this endure Mm. because it does keep you guessing as to what went wrong in the relationship since you've been gone all I've been left is a band of gold so you know we got married and now I've just got the wedding ring and that brings about the obvious question why but actually the original lyrics made it quite clear (laughs) it's just that it got cut Mm. which is quite interesting Mm. because it wasn't a deliberate puzzle that they set people what it left was this puzzle for people to be like okay I thought that you'd walk back through the door and love me like you tried before. Did that mean he was impotent? Or, but that Mm. night we slept in different rooms. What, on your wedding night? Was he gay? Was he a closeted gay man who married and now regretted it? There are, like, a dozen theories 
that are all wrong as to what the original intentions of the song were. Well, it depends who you believe, because this comes down to the mm. Ron Dunbar, Lamont Dozier rivalry again. So Ron Dunbar's story is that they had written this extra verse which explained the story. And this, in this extra verse, the singer says, and the memories of our wedding day and the night I turned you away. And it was supposed to be a song about a sexually naive newlywed who spurns her new husband. And Dunbar went on to claim he was surprised when he heard the song had been embraced by the gay community for its apparent meaning. And he says that if the cut verse had been included, that would have straightened the whole thing out, so to speak. Lamont Dozier says <laughs> it was about this guy that was basically gay and he couldn't perform. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But maybe he recognised that there were sales to be had, or at least by this time streams to be found in allowing for that ambiguity and so he didn't want to push away any potential interpretation because it's quite useful for him if it's being embraced by the gay community. Yeah, I mean, this is just pre-disco, isn't it, this era? And so you've got a song that sounds like a 60s Motown song, but it's not. It's 1970, this. And you're just ahead of all of those sort of Donna Summer, Gloria Gaynor type. I was about to say gay anthems because it just trips off the tongue. But of course, those are sort of yeah. insinuating gay anthems. They weren't written to be gay anthems. They're women talking about men in straight relationships generally. So this was kind of like that, wasn't it? And I suppose if you've got a cash cow and you've realised, oh, there's this whole market that have embraced this song, then you, you perhaps you would say that that was the intention, even if it wasn't. I mean, I do sort of believe... Yeah the version with the extra line because the extra line exists as you say you just quoted it and you can imagine that in the 60s like I mean now it would just feel really pervy and weird to have a song about a woman who was basically I mean frigid is the word they would have used then right but then it wouldn't have been weird that would have been a story that made sense Whereas hinting at a gay subtext in a massive mainstream pop song then would have been a lot more controversial. I mean, it's equally peculiar, though, to think that it might have been allowed to be left with this impotence interpretation. <laughs> I mean, that is also a curious subject matter for True. a pop song <laughs> in the well, 70s or at any time. And, you know, the first person to try and get to the bottom of the meaning was Frida Payne herself. She was later quoted as saying, I wondered why a girl would have a problem on her wedding night and why they would be in separate rooms. <laughs> but they said, just learn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a very casual working relationship as well because Frida Payne had gone to Hutchins Middle School yeah. in Detroit and she was there in the same year as Lamont Dozier and it's this same school in this period also educated Aretha Franklin, Diana Ross and Smokey Robinson. Amazing, isn't it? They turned it into a factory, didn't they? They made music like it was a product in Motown. And actually, mm. I think this is a rebuke, a song like this of this quality is a rebuke to people who say you can't get meaningful music from that sort of production line writing team, isn't it? Because the very fact we are still talking about it 50 years later and talking about does it mean this, does it mean that, the point is it's incredibly meaningful to a lot of people and it appears to be mm. about something and yet it's produced in the very generic sort of Stock Aiken and Waterman template type way that people assume means it's about nothing. It's also odd that it's thought of as an empowering anthem it's mentioned in the same breath as i will survive but it, it really isn't like the tone of it is nostalgic melancholic regretful mm. you know you don't hold up much hope for the heroine of this song do you having a good life now she's just been spurned on her wedding day what's weird is that it's partly because frida Payne's performance is quite ballsy and in your face she doesn't sound like she's been let down between the sheets so it's trying to reconcile those things in your head but actually if you listen to what she's singing about it's not empowering it's a woman who's been sort of screwed over by this guy as you mentioned it's not quite disco era but it's definitely a sort of proto disco and of course what made all those disco hits such gay anthems was that they right. were conveying a message of strength in the face of adversity you know they're not all songs about being yeah. great they're songs about coming back you know i will survive obviously being the classic mm. one and this really taps into that you know the heroine of the song is kind of at a low point but she sings in such a strident passionate way that you're kind of carried along on a wave of optimism even though the lyrics are actually pretty pessimistic yeah but that's really not in the song that's in the production isn't it like if you just look at the song on paper or sang it as a ballad it would be pretty mournful yeah, I defiantly will give in to this guy, is what she's seen. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes to show how much the performance and the production were crucial to Band of Gold becoming a hit, because if you look at the covers, it was covered twice, twice in very rapid succession in the 80s by Bonnie Tyler, who goes with a sort of high-octane synth vibe, and Belinda yes, Carlisle, no who goes really like throwaway yeah. bubblegum poppy. Neither one was a hit. Yeah. I think one of them got to like 91 in the charts or something, but neither of them was a hit at all. I was astonished that on the Carlisle version, Frida Payne had agreed to do backing vocals. 
And I thought, that's got to be a slap in the face to be your own weird cover band. <laughs> it's also one of the great musical mystery songs, isn't it? It sort of fits into that roster with, say, mm. you know, obviously the classic one is I Would Do Anything For Love. Well, this is it. I mean, if, if a song is strong enough, then the lyrical intrigue is a hook, but it's one that people forget and they just take away what they want from the song. It becomes the public song, doesn't it? Which is probably why Band of Gold is a surprisingly popular choice at weddings. Still, I mean, people are just, they hear like the drum beat and it's a Motown dance song and it's got Band of Gold in the lyrics. But I mean, it is about someone being dumped on their wedding day. It's like people dancing to I'll Be Watching You, which is about stalking your ex or You're Beautiful, which is about perving on somebody on the underground. Tomorrow. People have long enjoyed comparing climbing mountains to enlightenment years before Miley Cyrus. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.